Okay. Well, welcome back. Last week was Promotion Sunday. So uh, we are resuming our series on hope. And the two songs that I chose uh, all fit with something we're going to talk about at some point today. So, as we review just a little bit of what we did two weeks ago, uh, God shields our hope, shields our hope and our faith. And he does so by the exertion of his omnipotent dunamis power, the resurrection power that raised Christ from the dead. Shields our minds and our hearts. And again, we think of Ephesians 6 and the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness, protecting us, shielding us day in and day out. Of course, it's incumbent upon each of us to put those pieces of armor on day by day and throughout each day so that they can be of maximum shielding power. Uh, God also refines us. He refines our faith our hope and our love and our submission and our obedience through the trials that he allows in our life. He allows them sovereignly and he works, can work through them. Uh, and he is with us in the midst of those trials. Think of Psalm 23, even though he lead me through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. He's with us through those trials and he leads us through them. From the starting point to the ending point, probably into the next trial, but he is con constantly with us as our great shepherd, remembering that he has that shepherd's crook to draw us back in the club to beat off our enemies. As God works in us and helps us through everything, everything, our joy should grow. Peter said that we should be, what? Overflowing like a fountain with joy. Is that your experience day in and day out throughout each day? Probably not as much as it could be or should be. And then we're to grow in that. But that's that's the goal to be overflowing with joy uh, throughout each situation. With joy that's inexpressible and full of glory. Uh, and then there's that quote from Tozer that's on your sheet. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Worship is pure or base as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. And our view of God, our understanding of theology, is critical to our lives and to our level of hope, our level of faithfulness and of faith. We need to develop that high, exalted view of God that is oftentimes downplayed in our <clears throat> current time. Um, and we should be satisfied day in and day out with God's unfailing covenant love. And that should lead to praise throughout each day, singing for joy all day, every day. Rejoice always, Paul said. Um, as we anticipate and await the fullness of our salvation at the last day when Christ returns. That is what we're looking forward to. That is the goal, and our minds should be set on that. And as I've mentioned before, New Horizons has some articles this month 
that talk about being heavenly minded uh, and having that kind of perspective and outlook. And to that end, we're to prepare our minds for action, as we saw. We're to be sober minded. We're to set our hope fully, not partially, but fully on the grace that will be shown to us when Christ returns. Being fully freed from sin, evil, trials, death, plus being perfected and transformed in body and spirit, and being in God's blessed presence and enjoying it fully. That is our hope. And that's what we need to set our hope on and be thinking about. That that is where we are positionally, just not yet experientially. But we're going to that point. Now, given that future hope and that future state of being, as being the royal children, the royal children of the Heavenly Father, and given that God uh, has given us the command to be holy as we are holy, and given the fact that uh, he has told us to say no to sin and to seek to grow in holiness, and the fact that he is the judge who will bring to light everything and reveal it for what it was, um, we should be, and we are going to be evaluated and that we are accountable for everything, including every uh, wayward word, every uncareless word. We should be devoting ourselves to becoming more holy in thought, word, and deed day after day. And always in the forefront of our minds should be the uh, amazing fact that we are redeemed by the precious, infinitely costly blood of Christ. Okay, with that as uh, by way of review, let's go back to where we left off in uh, 1 Peter. Uh, we're going to be really concentrating on 22 and 23, but I do want to put it into context by reading, starting it reading at 15, but we've already covered that, but I want to put uh, 22 and 23 in that context. So, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have a sincere you have sincere love for your brothers love one another deeply from the heart for you have been born again not of perishable seed but of imperishable through the living enduring word of god so as we persevere in thinking and seeking to live in a holy obedient way according to the scriptures the truth of God's word that is revealed in the scriptures as we live that way in a purified ever more sanctified state we should increasingly do the following things and this is something we can look at in our own lives to see you know am I growing in the way I should be uh, am I doing these things? Am I obeying the truth day in and day out, saying no to sin? Do you have a sincere love for your brothers? And am I loving one another deeply from the heart? And that's not just, I love them, you know, in my, in my mind, in my heart, but are you actively manifesting your love for them by using your gifts, talents, and resources to serve them, to serve the church, and to build people up? Are you actively doing that and looking for opportunities to do that, especially maybe with those who might need it the most, those who are maybe by themselves 
or those who are downcast? Are you looking for those opportunities um, either by yourself or in conjunction with other people? Um, if we are sincerely, fervently loving one another, our brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, such brotherly love will be manifested and be seen by sacrificial acts of kindness, thoughtfulness, and uh, service of various types. Will, and this will be seen by others, including those who might come to visit our church. And they'll see we are Christians by our love. Think of that old song from uh, yesteryear uh, when some of us were first believers. Um, they will know we are Christians by our love, and we want, to, we want that to be man manifest to those round about us uh, and to encourage one another to do the same thing. Uh, they will see our faith and our hope and our love, and that will give us opportunities to give reason for the hope within us, to especially to unbelievers or those who are kind of downcast and kind of doubting God's love in their current situation, beleaguered by trials uh, and wondering, does God really care? We can help them as they see that we have our remaining, remaining steadfast in that hope and that faith, especially if we're going through trials at the time and we can share them. This is how God is helping me be rather even keeled through this difficult circumstance. Um, so others will be, and as this happens, others will be added to the kingdom. Uh, it'll, the manifestations of a new living, heavenly oriented life uh, will be shown uh, that we're born again from imperishable seed. And we wanna talk about the abiding word of God that is transforming our minds and our hearts. That same word, the Holy Spirit brings to our, not only illumines us as we hear it taught and preached, but also brings back to our memory in our time of need. And we want to be praying that God would do that, that we would remember that God is our refuge and our strength, our very present help in time of trouble, and that he has specific grace and mercy to help each specific trial that we go through. And we should be looking to him saying, I need help, and continuing to cry out to, for him to give us the help that we need to bring back to our remembrance those passages of scripture that will help us in those situations. Um, and that word of God will help us to prepare our minds for proper godly action that enables us to be sober-minded. Now, I want us to move forward into another passage of scripture. And we'll be spending some time in Ephesians. So turn with me there. Are there any questions or comments? Okay. I have a comment. Yes, sir. Grace through faith. Here it says we're saved through the living and abiding word of God. Well, not inconsistent, but uh, we the, it takes more than just faith, I guess. Well, we, we have faith because the word has been declared to us. How will they hear without preachers? And so there needs to be preachers who preach the word that we hear that we can have faith in. And it's that living, abiding word that transforms us by the work of the spirit within us. Anybody want to add or comment? Does that help, John? Yeah, I was just, I was just interested in noting that. So. Yeah. Well, it's faith in what, right? Yeah. And you just have to take that, dig deeper in a few steps. Your faith in Jesus Christ as your Redeemer. Right. Well, once you're there, what's the revelation of that? And that's the scripture. Mm -hmm. but it does take the living abiding word coming to us for us to be transformed by the spirit and regenerated and come to faith and growth 
incrementally from there. And we'll talk about that more, maybe even today. Okay, let's move to Ephesians chapter 1. I'm just going to start by reading verse 3 to start. Spiritual blessings in Christ is the uh, heading of this, path, this section in the Bible I'm working from. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with some, oh no, uh, many, no, every spiritual blessing in Christ. Every spiritual blessing is yours and yours and yours and mine in Christ. It's ours. But do we, are we benefiting from it? Are we, have we appropriated those blessings? Have we grabbed hold of them with both hands and held on tightly? All spiritual blessings are ours. They're ours because, why? Because we're united to Christ. And all those blessings are in him. And we must realize that we have those and we need to take action to grab hold of and appropriate them. Positionally, they're ours, but experientially, are we paupers? Because we're not grabbing hold of all those riches? How rich are you? You know, how much how much are you taking advantage of and grabbing hold of all those spiritual blessings? It takes concerted, continual effort to experience them to the fullest and to benefit from them. Now, here's a question for you. To what manner of life did God call us? Let's read verse 4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. What kind of life did he call us to? To be what? Holy and blameless. That word's an absolute, blameless, without any blame. And holy, we have to look at it in terms of who God is. God is how holy? Thank you. A little louder would have been nice. But perfectly holy. Completely holy. That's what he's called us to. To be perfectly holy, to be perfectly blameless. That is the bar. Yes, I know We'll never reach that far in this life. But our goal is to incrementally, you know, go up and to the right. Just like we want our sails to go up and to the right. Um, but in, these, in this verse, we see divine election. We see God's sovereignty. We see his irresistible grace. They permeate this verse in this, this section of scripture. God chose us individually. He chose you individually before the foundation of the world, to be in Christ for the purpose that you would end up being these two things, holy and blameless. And that is how we are positionally hidden Christ in heaven now. And if that is our ultimate goal and our goal to ultimate experience that we're going to have throughout eternity, it's incumbent upon us and logical and rational too, for us to seek to become more and more those things because that's what's best for us. That's what he's called us to. And we will enjoy that state as well as his beneficent presence in, throughout e all eternity. And that is hope indeed. And it is also a very high calling. But again, we are royal children. And if you're a royal child, and we've seen examples where they haven't <clears throat> lived um, appropriately as royal children, but uh, we are called to be royal children living appropriately as children of the king of kings. And that's the highest standard possible, even higher than the British royal family. Um, and so... By what means did he make this possible? Well, let's look further. In love, he predestined us 
to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. In accordance to his good pleasure, and I've got to read something, which I'll read in a second. According to his good pleasure, his, the kind intention of his perfect sovereign will, he manifested his covenant love by predestining us to be adopted as his beloved children. Uh, I want to read a comment by Charles Stanley. Success is the a continuing achievement of becoming the person God wants you to be. Let me read that again. Success is the continuing achievement of becoming the person God wants you to be. And that kind of person is holy and blameless in thought, word, and deed. We were slaves of Satan before God regenerated us, brought us from death to life. God redeemed us and freed us. He adopted us as his children. And now we are slaves of God. That's the term that's used throughout the New Testament, although there are many translations that put servant or bond servant instead of slave, but really the word is slave. And you, we have a master. Before we were saved, our master, to whom we were a slave, was Satan. Now that we've been born again, we have a new master, God, and we are his slaves. But he treats his slaves really, really well, um, because we are also his beloved children, his adopted children. But we are slaves of God. We are to do all that he has called us to do and be all he has called us to be. Uh, he did not do so because of some intrinsic good in us or because of anything we had done. But as verse 6 makes clear, clear, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves, Christ, whom he loved preeminently, but called to sacrifice himself on our behalf so that he could buy a people for his own possession. Um, we should adore our God because of all that he has done, uh, because of his grace, his unmerited favor. Uh, here's a quote from Sinclair Ferguson. God has made and keeps a commit covenant of personal commitment and love to his people. Let me read that again. God has made and keeps a covenant of personal commitment. Personal commitment. Personal. 24-7, 365 commitment to you and to me. And that's a covenant of, a commitment of love. And he is always there at all times to help you, to help me in every circumstance that we are in. And we need to keep that in the forefront of our minds and be calling out to him again and again, like the psalmists have given us examples. Um, he's be mercy to us with his ineffable love is an, another way to translate uh, verse six. Now let's continue to revel in what God has done for and provided to us as we read verses seven to 12. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things, all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him... We were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out some things, most things, no, everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. He cannot be thwarted. His will is always done. He superintends over all things. Verse 12, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. Stopping there. Um, uh, 
we, we revel in what God has done for us and provided for us, that inheritance that we reveled in as we read First Peter. And here we have more. Redemption from the bondage to the debt of sin, freed from that, pardoned for sin, through Christ pouring out his blood to atone for our sins. It is finished, he cried. It is paid in full. It's done with. And we don't have to uh, we, we realize that we are no longer under condemnation. We don't have to worry about that. Yes, we're accountable, but we're not under condemnation. And because of his great love, we should desire to make that evaluation go as smoothly as possible through being as obedient as possible. Um, we have the manifestation of his exceptionally deep love and affection for us. And additionally, in all wisdom and insight, God, through the scriptures, has made known to us the mystery of his will. The mystery. Um, that which is made clear now, that was not clear, it was in shadows before. The mystery of his will of salvation, his plan of redemption, that was kind of in shadows in the Old Testament, pointing forward to Christ. And when Christ came and fulfilled that, it made those things clear. What they pointed to was fulfilled in Christ, though there were still scales in the eyes of so many, including the many religious leaders. They didn't see right before their eyes the fulfillment of that which they had studied about that was in the Old Testament. But he was there. The mystery was revealed. Paul's job was to declare that mystery so that people would have faith going back to what John was talking about. Um, and he has made that hope known. Our Christian hope is based on knowledge and understanding. And the greater, more deeply we know and understand the scriptures, the greater, more robust will be our hope and our faith and our view of God. And that will determine our manner of life. Again, how high our view of God is, is key to the quality of life, the quality of the Christian life that we are going to live. The more, and that's why we should always want to be Bereans, studying the scriptures, seeing what is true, and then applying it. Um, the higher our view of God is, the greater our hope will be. They're tied together. Um, moving on. Verse 9, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. It was his good pleasure to reveal these things to us. He wants you to know it. He wants you to yearn to know it. We, are, we should yearn to know God better, his scriptures better, his commandments better, his will better. That should be increasingly our goal, to yearn to know those and to keep yearning because we will never be we will never reach a, a limit of how much we could know, how deeply we could understand. Now, I wrote a, a definition for mystery here. It's not in your notes. Um, the disclosure of the design sovereign grace in time centered in Jesus himself, both the sum and solution of all unsearchabilities of the eternal will. This masterpiece of mercy founded in reasons beyond our scrutiny, constitutes a system of its own. F.F. F. Bruce. Let me read that one more time. Mystery. The disclosure of the design sovereign grace in time, centered in Jesus himself, both the sum and solution of all unsearchabilities of the eternal will, this masterpiece of mercy founded in reasons beyond our scrutiny, beyond our understanding, constitutes a system of its own. Well put. And God wants you to understand that as deeply as possible. Um, what motivated him to make it known? He motiv what motivated him was that he purposed it in Christ, as verse 4 said, that we would be holy and blameless. Again, right thinking, orthodoxy, must, must lead to 
proper living, orthopraxy. It must come out of that. Head knowledge by itself, I have a quote, I'm gonna to jump to it um, now. Um, well, I'll, I'll do two quotes. Um, from, uh, f first from David Jeremiah. Uh, for me, the word of God is everything. It informs all my decisions, all my decisions. Do we take everything to the Lord in prayer and consider it in accordance with his word? I know we could all do better than that. It informs all of my decisions. What the Bible say it says takes precedence over whatever anyone else says. It is, after all, God's word. And then uh, from Reverend Jason Halopoulos, uh, training our minds to think rightly about the things of God is our lifelong calling and produces life. Complacency with what we know of God and his truth, I, there was a typo, my fault, not trust, but truth, but his truth is a toxic poison. <clears throat> if we don't put into practice what we study, what we hear, if we just let it sit in our minds, we're being complacent, and that's toxic. Think about that. Um, uh, this is a view, uh, again, this is a view of God's end game. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that, it's a purpose clause, that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Again, talking about the purpose of our lives, which we know, as we've said from the catechism question number one, the chief end of man is to glorify God through everything we think, say, and do, but also to enjoy him forever. And again, that will be our state, our way of life in heaven. Positionally, we're there. Experientially, we need to work to be, make that more and more a reality in our lives now, because that is our reality in the future, and therefore, that is what is best for us. That is what will bring the greatest fulfillment. This is the inheritance that we mentioned, that's mentioned in verse 11 that we talked about in First Peter as well. This is what we've been predestined for. Before the foundation of the world, God chose and predestined us to be adopted as his children into his eternal heavenly family. And that was in accordance with him who works all things, all things, providentially according to the counsel of his will. And one of the results is that, is in, in verse 12, that we, we were first hoped in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. And let me just read that amplified version of Colossians 3.3 3 that's on your sheet. In him, Christ, all the treasures of divine wisdom, comprehensive insight into the ways and purposes of God, and all the riches of spiritual knowledge and enlightenment are stored up and lie hidden. Kind of fleshes it out a little bit more so we can think about the richness of that. Now, verses 13 and 14. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your, of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. God's glory redounds throughout this book as being the highest goal, the highest good. He describes how our salvation and our inheritance are guaranteed in Christ. And we've talked about this before, that we have the seal of the Holy Spirit. 
the indwelling spirit. The message of the truth, the gospel of salvation, the message of truth must be declared, as we talked about earlier. There has to be a preacher. There has to be preaching. There has to be hearing. And there has to be believing and then acting in faith, in obedience, submitting to the lordship of Christ. It must be declared, must be heard, must be believed. And believing in Christ and in his saving, redeeming work, receiving and being sealed in Christ by the powerful indwelling Holy Spirit, the comforter, the paraclete, the deposit, the earnest that absolutely guarantees that we will absolutely receive not just some of what God has promised, but all that God has promised to you and to me to give to those who believe it, who trust in him, his great, precious, eternal promises. Our reception of this will be to the praise of his glory. And it is what is absolutely best for us. Positionally, we possess it already. But how much of it are we experiencing? How much of his, all his spiritual blessings are we currently enjoying and benefiting from? Again, it takes continual, concerted effort on our part. An intentionality every day and throughout each day. It's good to start the day with prayer and to end the day with prayer, but Paul tells us to pray without ceasing, to always be in that state of prayer, of recognizing God's preeminence and our desperate, deep need for his help in all circumstances, and to be able to make our decisions always based upon his word and by the leading of the spirit. I know, I know, it's not possible, is it? We fail. We don't do that enough. But our goal is to seek to incrementally improve and to help one another improve, to stimulate one another in these areas. Um, we don't enjoy all the fullness that is ours. Now we know in part, then we will know in full. Now we enjoy some measure of joy and bliss because of our relationship with God, then we will absolutely be overflowing continually throughout all eternity. And our goal here in this life is to work toward that experience because, again, that's what's best for us. That's what will bring us the most satisfaction, not the empty promises of things that are offered by the world. We long, we should long, we should yearn for these things. The, the earth is what? Groaning in anticipation of Christ's return and of making everything perfect as it was in the beginning before sin. We too should groan for that blessed day. And oh, what a day that will be. This is very unusual. I have actually come to the end of what I prepared for today. And normally I have to uh, uh, carry on the following week with more information uh, with where we left off, but that's not the case today. So questions, comments. Yes, Susan. On some level of life, since we are distinct in Christ, I know the kingdom of God is taken by force. On some level, can't we rest in the fact that we're not aware of that part? Kind of sounds a little Roman Catholic to me. Oh, dear. Mm -hmm. Certainly don't mean to sound Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we, well, we rest in him. We rely upon him. He is our refuge and strength. Um, but so you have... You have verses like pressing toward the goal. And it, that is in a continue that the, the tense of that verb is continually. So we're continually pressing, but yes, what we're resting in him, relying upon him, 
and there we don't have to it just like our bodies need rest and sleep i mean we're not going to be thinking about this 24 7 365 yes and we're not going to be making that effort but it should be throughout it should be something that is throughout each day um and so it's kind of a both and and uh, so both are true and it's that's beyond our ability to really understand isn't it um but we have to be intentional about seeking him relying upon him learning from him and glorifying him in thought word and deed in every situation that should be our mindset but yes we're depending upon him to guide us, we're depending on that Holy Spirit to illumine our minds and to bring to our minds the passages of Scripture, maybe hymns that are helpful to guide us in making those decisions. Um, does that help? Is that less Roman Catholic? <laughs> yes. Maybe a distinction between those two is that the motivation for our striving and our good works and everything. The Roman Catholic view, the motivation is to attain it. Yes. To get the position. Yes, to earn it. That we already have. Yeah. So for us, it's a striving to be more of who we already are. Yes. Yes. Exactly. My point. That is who we are positionally, and we want to experience that more and yet more because that is what is most fulfilling. That is what is most satisfying. And that also is what brings God the most glory. And again, those two things go hand in hand, enjoying him and glorifying him. And yes, we do need rest. We need, need times of comfort. We need times where we're being ministered to, but we also have to look for opportunities to minister to others and to stimulate them in these ways. Good. Other thoughts, other questions? If not, I'll close this. And we'll have a couple extra minutes. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We thank you that we have the high privilege of coming into your presence, not because of anything intrinsic in us, but because of Christ's righteousness with which we are clothed. And we are so thankful that you have taken off the dirty clothes, the filthy, corrupted clothes of our sins and our unrighteousness, and you have clothed us uh, with the righteousness of Christ so that we have that privilege and that uh, ability to come into your presence. Father, we re recognize that we have a very high calling to be holy, to be blameless, to live properly as royal children of the king of kings we acknowledge that we fail left and right but we thank you that you bear with us that you are patient with us and that you have given us your holy spirit to dwell within us to help lead and guide us help us to want to walk nay to run with perseverance on that highway of holiness that is lit up by your word and not turn to the right or to the left into the darkness onto the slippery slopes, but help us to stay on the uh, path that has been cleared for us and run with perseverance the race that is set before each one of us and help us to grow in our knowledge of you, our knowledge of your word, our knowledge of your commandments, and in our experience as being who we are in Christ, where our lives are hid, that are perfected positionally, Help us to become more like that which we will be like for all eternity. Help us to find rest and satisfaction and fulfillment in you and in the things of God. And help us to grow in our yearning and longing to be made more like Christ, to be conformed more to his image as you transform us through your word and through your spirit. Help us to be there for one another, to encourage and stimulate one another to love and good deeds and toward these high and lofty goals that you have set before us. And help us to 
Build one another up, providing comfort and encouragement, especially when people are down. Help us to help turn one another's eyes to you and to how you have been faithful, not only through all the time of the scriptures, but also in the lives of those round about us and those they know. Pray that you would be with us now and prepare us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll continue on in Ephesians next week. Do you know anything about the service? Morning, Rod. I'm sorry.